All right, well, welcome back to, le to our class in Genesis today. I uh, hope you guys have had a good week, and uh, those of you who are watching, I pray that uh, the, last, the last discussion we had uh, was beneficial to you. And we're going to go ahead and continue today, and this time we'll be actually getting into the meat of the book. So go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> we'll be starting, of course, at the very beginning of the book, but... Uh, just by real quick way of review, last time we talked about why do we study the book of Genesis? Why is the study of Genesis important? Um, to many of us here in the Western world, we, we most of us kind of know the book of Genesis. We may not know it exactly by heart, but we have a general idea about the contents uh, within it. So why is it important that we go back to the study of Genesis? Why do we study the first book? over again. And I gave four points, and first of all, it's God's Word, and God wants us to study His Word. If we believe that the Bible is God's Word, and that the book of Genesis is a part of those 66 books, then uh, in order to please God, we ought to study it. We then talked about how it is foundational to doctrine. In the first 11 chapters, there are so many doctrines that are talked about. The doctrine of salvation in Genesis 3, uh, as well as the doctrine of uh, mankind's fall and sin are found there. We talked about uh, the doctrine or the establishment of, of marriage, as well as uh, many other key doctrines are found, uh, even within just the first 11 books. We also talked about how it's a record of origins. How did we get here? Uh, where did all the languages come from? Uh, why do we have so many nationalities and cultures all around the planet? Uh, why do we have geological structures that we see in the world today? Uh, it is the first 12 books of, or the first, excuse me, 12 chapters of Genesis and tell us how all these things came to be. And so that's, that makes it important to study. And we also study it because the book is under attack. As the world becomes less and less godly as they move further and further away uh, from Jesus Christ and from the God of the Bible, they understand that the best way to cause uh, others to doubt the faith is to attack its very foundations. And so knowing the book, knowing the book Genesis is important uh, to help us uh, be able to defend our faith, to be able to, uh, as it says later in the New Testament, uh, give an answer to those who would question uh, our beliefs. <clears throat> so as we study, we're going to go ahead and now look at uh, the very first chapter in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. This is Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So our first point today is going to be the pre-existing God and a formless universe. And I have some points under here. Uh, as we look in, this, in these first two verses, there are some uh, key takeaways that we need to uh, understand as we uh, look at the Bible and as we understand the Bible as a whole. First of all, uh, God has had an eternal existence. God has had an eternal existence. It says, in the beginning, God created. Notice that it does not say, in the beginning, God was formed. It does not say, in the beginning, God appeared. It just says, in the beginning, God created. Amen. Understanding that before there was a beginning, God was there. Yes. And if you believe in the eternality of God, God is there. Yes. Because God is outside of time. Because God created time. In the beginning, before there was time, before anything else existed, God existed. And there are many verses throughout the Bible that talk about this. I uh, picked Ephesians 1, uh, verses 3 through 4, which say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before God had even created anything, he had chosen us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
So before anything ever was, before anything ever existed, God was there and he already knew what he was going to do. He already had a plan in mind and he already knew what was going to happen in the Garden of Eden. He already knew what he was going to have to do to redeem us and he had chosen us. Now that's not to say that he specifically said, okay, well that person's going to be saved. I, I don't like that person, so that person's not going to be saved. No, no, that's not what he meant by he chose us. But he knew which of us would be, which of us would believe, and he chose us to be holy. Those who believe, he said, I will set them apart. I will make them holy. And that was before anything ever was. So God has always existed. Nothing created God. There is nothing above God. Amen. We also see within this God's desire for order. If you look back at verse 2, it describes the universe before God did anything to it. It was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Everything was in chaos. Everything was void and without form. There was, there was no order. There was just chaos. But we know that God is a God of order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul talks about how God is a God of order. Verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion. God does not create chaos. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. When we talk about a country or a people or, or a situation being in peace, we're talking about something being in order. When I, I'm a teacher, and when my classroom is peaceful, my students are sitting at their desks, doing what they're supposed to be doing, and there isn't a mass chaos of movement and talking. Everyone is doing exactly what they should be doing. Everything is peaceful. But when everyone starts talking, and they're trying to talk over each other, and you know, you got one person moving from one side of the room to the other and another person trying to sit in someone else's desk. We call that chaos. It's confusion. But even further on in verse 40, Paul says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Understanding that this is the word of God and that God inspired Paul to write these words, there is a clear desire from God here that things ought to be done in order. And so in the beginning, when things were out of order, we can see that God is a God of order. God does not author confusion. That's right. When we study God's word, we need to understand that, there, that while we may not understand something at the moment, God is not intentionally trying to confuse us. God is not intentionally trying to trick us into believing one thing when it's actually something else. That's, that's the result of man's sin. But when God authored his word, there is nothing that is disorderly within it. Everything is in the exact order that God wanted it. When world events happen and things seem chaotic because of man's sin, we have to understand that God is in control and that God has a plan and that God can take the confusion that mankind has created and bring it into order. Amen. And so we see that even from the very beginning. One thing I want to point out in this is that this is not a pre-existing world. There are some who would say that there is a span of millions of years between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. That God created the heaven and the earth and that there was a, I guess you could say, earth one before this earth and that everything evolved and that you had millions and millions of years that occurred on this, on this earth and then God destroyed it in a flood and then Genesis 2 comes. There are some who believe that. Um, one of the study Bibles that I was, I was referencing as I was going through here mentioned that. I'm like, this, this, this isn't right. It's an attempt to take man's false belief right. that uh, the earth has been around for billions of years and try to reconcile it with the Bible. This is not a pre-existing world. This is how the universe was when God brought everything into order. And we need to understand that. 
because there are some who would try to say, oh, there's millions of years between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. There are not. That is just a description of how the world was before God created everything. So, as we look at how God brought this chaotic uh, universe into order, first of all, uh, he said, let there be light. Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Amen. So right here in Genesis 1-3, we have the beginning of time. We also have the beginning of order. We have this chaotic universe. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. But we also see that this is the beginning of time. He called the light day and he called the darkness night. So time is created on day one. Light is created on day one. Order is finally being brought to the chaos. We now have clear divisions that are being established. Some people say that it was at this time that the angels were created. The Bible does not mention in Genesis 1 uh, when the angels were created. But we, if we understand that before anything was created, it was God and a formless universe, that the angels would have been created at some point during creation. We do not know when. I'm just bringing this up as a point because there is some, uh, there are some speculations on this. Some say it was on day one when he created light. Others say it was on day four uh, when he created the stars. And we'll talk about that when we get to uh, that point. Um, and others say that this is possibly when uh, heaven was created as well because we understand that um, heaven is a part of that creation. God created it. We do not know, but I bring it up because there is speculation on that point. Notice that the light was formed before any sources of light were formed. I like this because one of the things that uh, people who do not believe in the Word of God try to use to trip up Christians is that it takes a really long time for light to go from the stars to earth that we are seeing stars that are millions of light years away and they try to use that as a proof of evolution and they say well how can we see these stars if the earth is only 6,000 years old how are we able to see them they're so far away the light would not have reached here by now well you gotta understand God created the light before he created the stars amen the light was already here it didn't have to travel anywhere God said let there be light and there was light, and only later did he put the stars in place. Amen. And so I like the fact that God, in his foresight, created the light first. And that's just my simple explanation. And, and some don't accept that. But the fact of the matter is, that's what the Bible teaches. Amen. And whether a man accepts it or not, that doesn't change what the truth is. Amen. The truth is, God created the light, it was always here. So whether that star is millions of light years away or not, that doesn't change the fact that the earth is not billions of years old. So, God created the light. Number two, on day two, he created divisions between the waters. Verses six through eight saying, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so and God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day so here we have another division taking place notice that throughout all of this creating of order there is division God is saying let's split things up let's put things in their proper categories that's part of organization. When I organize uh, a desk or an office or a filing cabinet, I don't just throw all the papers into, into one folder and expect that to somehow help me out. I divide things up. I can say, okay, all right, you know, the stuff that I need for this day goes here, the stuff I need for this day goes here. God is creating order 
by dividing things. This is the creation of what we call the atmosphere, the sky. Everything was disorderly and disorganized and you had waters mixing with waters and God said, all right, let's split this up. And so you have the water on earth being separated from, it says, the waters above. There are different speculations on this. Some say uh, that it, this refers to the clouds, that uh, the waters below, of course, refer to the lakes, the streams, the rivers, the oceans, etc., what we have here on earth, and that the water above is the clouds. Uh, others say that there was possibly uh, a second sphere of water um, that God separated with the firmament, that you had water on earth and then the firmament and then another kind of, I guess you could say, bubble of water over top. And, and some of the evidence they use for that comes from Genesis 7 where it talks about uh, the floodgates of heaven being opened during the, when uh, God destroyed the earth with a flood. It talks about how uh, this massive amount of water came from the sky to help flood the earth. And so they say, well, maybe perhaps there was a there was an extra layer similar to how we have uh, the ozone layer uh, protecting uh, us from the sun's radiation. Now they say, well, there was an extra layer of water that God had used uh, to help further protect the earth. And that's what he meant by separating the water from the water. Again, the Bible is not 100% clear on this, and certainly we know that we don't have a sphere of water around the earth now. Um, so it could just be a separation of the sky, but what's clear here is that waters are being divided. That there is water in the sky, we understand that, through evaporation processes, through the clouds that we see and the rain that comes down and the other forms of precipitation, and there's water here on earth. Yes. And that a sky separates them. And that's what this verse refer that's what these verses reference the creation of the sky separating waters <clears throat> on the next day verse starting in verse 9 we have the creation of dry land or not the creation of dry land but the separation of land from water and also plants being created verse 9 and God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So on day three now, we have the chaotic waters on the planet, the waters that are separated already, okay, so there was already some order being brought there, but then the waters that were here on the earth, God separated them and brought forth dry land, not wet, soggy land, not primordial soup that would eventually turn into animal kind, Okay, but dry land. And he called it earth. So we have yet another division where this dry land comes forth. <clears throat> During this time, the plants came forth, but notice there's no sun yet. A simple study of botany will show that plants require the sun to be able to grow. That's part of how they maintain their existence. That's where they get their energy from to be able to grow. But notice, God here brings the plants forth before there is even sun. Now there is light, to be sure. But understand that if the earth is millions or billions of years old and God used evolution to create everything, the plants would not have survived. They would have died out because they didn't have the sun to give them the energy. And so we have to understand again that each of these days is not a reference to millions of years. It's not like God created light one day and then said, I'm going to wait a few million years and then I'll create a sky and then I'll wait a few million years more and, and bring forth dry land and plants and I'll wait a few million. No. The word that's used in the Bible is day. Amen. 
24 hours God took on each one. Now, to be sure, he could have created everything all on the same day. He could have. On day one, he could, he could have spoken everything into existence. He could have. But again, what is God doing here? He is creating order. And as he is creating order, he is giving us a framework for our own work week. God is taking seven days to work and to rest to show us how we ought to work and rest. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this in the next lesson uh, when we talk about the formation of mankind. God here is not just throwing everything out and all at once. He is, again, creating order out of chaos. And we even see that in how he is bringing forth everything and in the timeliness that he's bringing forth everything. One other way in that he's bringing about order is having the plants reproduce after their kind. Two plants of different kinds cannot uh, pollinate and have uh, a completely new kind of hybrid plant. Now, hybrid plants do exist, but they're hybrids within their kind. You don't have, I can't take grass pollen and uh, a, tree, a, a fruit from a tree and somehow create a, a morphing of the two. I can't do that because they are different kinds. I can't take uh, an animal and try to crossbreed it with a plant because they are two separate kinds. And so God here is not only uh, bringing forth plants um, as a way to, to decorate the earth, and I'm so thankful he did, uh, but he's also creating order in even how those plants continue their life cycle. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out with creation. The most important one is, of course, God here is providing food. There are no animals yet. Mankind has not been brought forth, but God here is preparing for that. So that when the animals are formed, when mankind is created, there is a food source waiting for them in these plants. There are other reasons why God created these plants. One thing that I used to wonder when I was younger was why are plants green? Why, why is it that most of the plants on earth are green? Yeah, we have certain plants that, that um, are different colors and certainly they bring forth flowers that are often different colors, but the vast majority of plants are green. Amen. And as a child I used to wonder that, but then as I grew older and, and started reading and and thinking through different things, I realized something wonderful about the way that God created things. In the human mind, the color green is a very calming color. It's a color that tells us that things are safe, that things are calm. It, it's, it calms the brain down. To look at green lowers stress levels. But when you look at red or yellow or orange, those colors, even though I do appreciate looking at the color red, I appreciate wearing red, those things tend to uh, heighten the mind. They put you on alert. Maybe not for danger, but your mind is more active when looking at yellow or orange or red. But when you look at green and blue, your mind calms down. And so God created everything to be, all these plants to be green Number one, to create that calming environment. The Garden of Eden was a peaceful place. It was not meant to be a place of chaos or of, of heightened alertness. It was meant to be a place of peace for mankind to walk with God. And all throughout nature, whenever you see something red, perhaps a poisonous mushroom, a lot of poisonous snakes have the color red. Red makes us think of danger. Fire is orange and red. And so when God created everything to be green, it was a way to bring about peace within the mind. And I just think that is an interesting provision that God made here on this planet. He could have given us an earth that was gray. He could have. But he didn't. And I'm thankful for all the different colors that we have. And I'm thankful 
that on a day where perhaps I've had a hard day, I can go out and sit by a, sit by a lake and see all the green around me, see the blue of the lake and the blue of the sky, and it brings that sense of peace and calm to my mind because that's how God created it. But most importantly, these plants were here to give us food, even though we hadn't come around yet. He did not create man first and then create man's food source. He wanted to make sure that man had everything that he needed the moment that he was formed. <clears throat> However, God turns his attention back into outer space. Starting in verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for light in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So now we have the creation of the lights. So we have the light being formed on day one, and now we have the lights, plural, on day two, or uh, excuse me, on day four. <clears throat> God created the lights. So at this point we have uh, the sources of light being created. Remember, the light is already there, but now God puts into place the sun. He puts into place the moon. He puts into place the stars that are millions of light years away. He puts all these into place on day four after he created the plants. And this is where time is finally completely organized. We had day and night, but now we have seasons. We have months. We have um, days being able to be calculated from the movement of the sun. Uh, or excuse me, from the movement of the earth around the sun. Don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that the earth is stationary and everything moves around it. No. But as the earth moves around the sun, we are now able to calculate uh, how long that day uh, actually is. Okay. So God here is not just putting these lights up there to look nice, although certainly they do. I, I, do, enjoy light, I do enjoy looking at uh, the pictures that the Hubble Space Telescope takes of the heavens that are beyond... Uh, our eyesight. There are so many amazing things that are out there that God has put into place. Um, so they're not just there to look pretty, although certainly they are. They serve a purpose. They serve a function. And that's one thing that we can notice throughout all of this creation is that everything serves its own purpose. God did not just create something necessarily to just sit there and look pretty. It has a function. It has a purpose in creation. And that's going to be important when mankind is formed. There is no man that doesn't serve a function. Everyone has a purpose Amen. in God's order and in God's creation. So time is organized by these uh, things. By the sun. By the moon. Uh, by the location of the stars as the earth moves through the heavens. We can also tell uh, time from those as well. The seasons, specifically. Uh, this is where... Um, most, I th this is where I believe possibly the angels were created just by their name, uh, that they are often referenced as uh, stars throughout the Bible. I'll just point out two verses uh, in Job 38, verse 7. <clears throat> Again, I, this is not a, this is man's opinion here. This is not the Bible saying, and God created the angels on day four. But based on what I have seen from the scriptures, and I'm not alone in this. This is where some believe the angels were formed. Um, Job 38, verse 6, the Lord is talking to Job. Okay, Job has just spent uh, the book talking about... Um, he's, he spent the book talking about what God is, has done to him and how terrible his friends are. And God finally... Uh, and it says, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Verse, in verse 1. Verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay, that's, that's one reference, uh, talking about 
angels being stars, as well as uh, sons of God. But then we look at Revelations 12. <clears throat> we see another reference to angels being stars. And there are others as well, but these are the two that I, that I picked. Uh, this is talking about um, a great wonder. John is here describing something that he is seeing uh, that God is allowing him to see. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, red dragon, having seven heads and ten hordes and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew a third of this part of the stars uh, from of the stars of heaven, and did cast them uh, to the earth. When Satan rebelled, he took with him one third of the angels in his rebellion. So again, this is man's opinion. This is when I believe that God created the angels as well, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, because there are people who will say, well, when, when were the angels created? And ultimately, because God did not point it out, he must have felt that it was not deeply important for us to understand for our faith. And so I want to point that out. That this is not a key doctrine. When is it? Is it important when the angels were created? No, because if it was very important, God would have said, this is where they were. But I point that out because some people will try to bring that up as a point of contention. But God did create them at some point. They were not part of his pre-existence beforehand. Moving on then, we now have moving life coming forth in verse, uh, let's see, where am I? Verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowls multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So day five comes on. The sun rises. We finally have our first sunrise on uh, day five. And God brings forth moving life. Previously, we had had the plants, but now we have a moving life. These animals. These, specifically the whales, and the other uh, fish of the sea, these other sea creatures come forth. And not only that, the birds. So now God is starting to fill this planet. The dry land has plants upon it, and now the seas have life within them, and the firmament now has life that is able to move uh, through it as well. Notice again, importantly, everything reproduces after its kind. Amen. I keep emphasizing this because again, this is where this is where we disagree with mankind's hypothesis of evolution. Amen. That said things could come from other things. No, according to the Bible, everything comes only from its own kind. Yeah. It would be impossible for a fish to become a lizard. Yeah. It would be impossible for a lizard to become a bird. It is impossible for a man to come from an ape. That's right. Because everything reproduces after its kind. Yes. And that is such an important concept that every Christian needs to understand and that every Christian needs to stand firm on that everything reproduces after its kind. But we're seeing a breakdown of that in our societies today. And that is, it's a tragedy. But we have to remember that it is Satan's attempt to discredit the Word of God. But scientifically, we know that it is impossible to get something from something else that was not its original kind. It is impossible to do. And God ordained that from the beginning of his word. Mm. Back in the 1700s, it was believed, and, and before, it was believed that uh, things could just spontaneously come from nothing. Um, I believe it was the 1700s. I might get, be getting my dates wrong. But it was during that time that it was believed that things such as uh, flies uh, just came, kind of came from rotting meat. But it took several scientists 
to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that no, rotting, rotting beef does not produce flies. Flies come from other flies. A fly would come and lay its eggs. And yes, even though those eggs are really, really tiny and really, really hard to see with the human eyes, there are eggs there and it's flies coming from flies, not flies coming from cows. But God knew that all the way from the beginning. And that's the way that God created it. And those who studied his word have known that just by reading his word. <clears throat> we come to day six, the last day of creation. God says in verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. There's our key word, kind there. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. God's not done here. Notice I didn't read in the evening and the morning were the sixth day, because God is not yet done on this day. But I think as a special creation, mankind deserves its own lesson. I didn't want to try to shove mankind as important as we are into the last you know, three minutes of a lecture. And so we're going to talk in the next lesson about the special creation of mankind. But we also need to point out here that on this day also were created the beasts of the earth. All manner of living creature that lives upon the dry land is created at this point. But God isn't done. And, and one thing that I want to leave us with here before I dismiss is that God did not just speak us into existence. Everything else was spoken mm -hmm. into existence. God said, let there be, let there be, let there be. But with mankind, God said, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Yes. And so as we look at the creation, certainly we can marvel at that creation. Certainly uh, I can appreciate what God has created, and I ought to appreciate it, and I ought to take care of it. But ultimately... In the grand scope of God's work, mankind is the most important thing on this planet. Yes, I have a responsibility to take care of this planet given by God. We'll talk about that next week. But ultimately, God just spoke everything else into existence. And even though it may be bigger than me, even though um, compared to it I may seem very, very tiny, in God's eyes, I and everyone in this room and everyone watching are far more important than the biggest tree, than the most distant star, mm. than the planets that wander through their courses. Mankind is the most important. Thank you for uh, listening. I do appreciate it. And I will see you all next week.